All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, my apologies that we're a little late kicking off this morning. Um, welcome um, elected members, uh, staff and um, guests. And um, obviously welcome to people who are watching this online. As, as not, um, you're all aware we're continuing to live stream our meetings. So just a reminder in that space. So let's uh, get um, this meeting going. Today's Strategic Planning and Policy Committee meeting. I believe it's the second to last one for the year, which is kind of terrifying and exciting all at the same time. Um, first cab off the rank is apologies. Perhaps, um, oh no, Hazel's just joined us. Excellent, we don't need to put apologies for lateness for her in. Um, other than that, I believe we're all here. I haven't received any apologies from anybody, so we'll move on from that one into the next item, which is disclosure of members' interests. Um, Phil, you're waving your arm around. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just under the district plan, plan change 13, it's un under the public excluded section of the meeting. Um, there's a brief discuss discussion about that, so plan change 13. Uh, okay. the district plan. Okay, thank you, Phil. So we'll note that when we move on to that. Any other um, declarations of interest there? No. Excellent. Moving on then to the next um, issue, which is late items. I'm not aware of there being any. Um, wave your hand frantically or tell me if there is anything to add. No, nobody's waving frantically at me. So. With that said, we'll move on then to the uh, next item, which is confirmation of order of the meeting. And as we have no late items, I, the recommendation is that we just confirm the order of the meeting as it appears in our agenda. Can I have somebody happy to move? Happy Lou's to move. happy to move. Marcus, happy to second. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. Carried. So that then takes us to our next item, which is confirmation of minutes of our previous meeting on the 2nd of November. Um, now, these minutes appear on from page eight onwards on our agenda and as is our usual practice I'll just say the page numbers and if there's something to um, discuss wave your arms around or interrupt um, pages eight and nine 10 11 12 and 13. Now everybody's comfortable with those I'll move. okay Andrew's happy to move uh, Roger's happy to second. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. So that takes us to our first sort of substantive item, which is the Community Services Quarterly Report. Brad, I believe you're the writer of this item and you are here. Good morning. Morena. Thanks, Madam Chair. Morena Tato. <clears throat> um, so this morning I'll just go over some of the, the key highlights of uh, the, the previous quarter for our community services areas. Um, as you'll be aware, uh, the last quarter was impacted by the re-emergence of COVID-19 in our community. Um, and it did touch on all areas of our business with the way we operate alongside, our, alongside the closure of some of our community facilities. Um, some, of the, some of the good ones we had was uh, we, we completed the avenue planting down John Hewitt Drive leading to Waipuki Park. Um, this was completed despite COVID-19 disruptions um, and it's been a long time coming so um, this will provide a, a really beautiful avenue um, as we lead into that quite um, popular reserve. Alongside this we uh, partnered with the Cambridge Tree Trust uh, who began planting some of the triangle um, gardens. Um, we're putting native, native plants in there to uh, further strengthen the biodiversity corridor between Mangatauteri and the Awa. Unfortunately, we did see um, some continued vandalism in our parks uh, with Bulmers Landing and Kanifa Nefer Reserve, um, particular hotspots in, in this last quarter. I'm sure that some of you will have been contacted by residents um, in the district relating to some of this antisocial behaviour. Um, we do have a programme of works to address this at some of our hotspots, at our, our key hotspots at the moment, um, which does include security cameras, speed bumps um, and some new gating. But... Um, this program of work has also been impacted uh, with the uh, COVID-19 delays with some suppliers being based in Auckland or some of the freighting issues. Um, we've also been working more recently um, on Bulmers Landing with Comsafe um, here in Tiamutu who, who have sort of taken a bit of a steer um, with the community there. Um, our library's team did a fantastic job um, between the change in alert levels. Uh, and the first week back into alert level two in September, the team issued um, just under 12,000 items and had 
um, seven and a half, well, just over seven and a half thousand returns. Um, and, and all those returns had to be quarantined prior to reissue. So um, we've definitely seen a big rush to the libraries as soon as there was any mention of a, a change in alert level um, into, into the lockdown sort of state. We, it's often, you know, when people get sick, they go home and grab some, or on the way home, grab some books from the libraries. And we definitely saw that same mentality um, as we headed into lockdown. Um, and we were successful with some um, additional funding um, from the National Library Partnership Program. Uh, they supplied just over $10,000 for us for some reasonable masks for staff um, alongside some additional ebooks. And the museum team also had to quickly pivot um, this, this service uh, with the emergence of um, COVID-19. A great example of this was um, the Plan Poi and Tirako stick games activities, um, which they reconfigured to be take-home packs um, and, and on, offered virtual and structural content. So um, still, still plenty of good stuff going on in the, in the last quarter, even though you know <laughs> it was a bit of a changing world, um, which are all standing grapple with still. Um, but yeah, happy to take any questions that you might have, have on the report. Thank you, Brad. Um, Claire. Yeah, th thanks, Brad. And a great report. In fact, um, yeah, it's fantastic that the staff can carry on doing these things in a creative way. That's good. I do have a question about the pool policy uh, because um, Bruce and I have had an email from someone who can't go to the pools anymore because they don't have a vaccine certificate. And she has pointed out that under the COVID um, guidelines, um, under business.gov.nz, it says that the restrictions are the same whether the vaccine pass verification is used or not. But it looks like um, the you know, go why par I might be taking a more conservative approach. And I just need to understand, you know, are they within their rights? Was there a different reason apart from the fact that they still have to observe capacity limits and and do distancing? Yeah, kia ora, kia ora. Yeah. thanks, thanks, Councillor St. Pierre. Um, three, Madam Chair, um, we do have this as an item later on um, around the vaccine discussion. I'm, I'm just wondering whether it's I'm happy to answer what I can now, or whether I'm just want, conscious that it may be better to hold it to that point later in, in the workshop. What would be your um, position? Uh, you well, it's just that um, it looks like the decision's already been made by by the yeah. pool facility people. If yeah. I yeah, if I can through the chair, um, in terms of the assessment that Go Waipa have made for their facilities that they operate, um, essentially as they, they lease in and we have an agreement for them to operate, they have made their decisions based on what their operations are within the, the framework. Um, as um, um, they have also made those decisions based on the health and safety of their staff and taking that approach. So my understanding that the board has agreed their approach, which is looking at the health and safety requirements of their staff as well as patrons. So um, that is the decision that they've made to enable them to operate. Um, and that is under the, the, the protection framework um, in terms of the information they had last week on that. Um, obviously, we are all great playing with what the protection framework means and how we operate under this, um, but that is the stance that they've taken from a health and safety perspective. And that's what they're required under, under the legislation to do for their staff in the first order. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Sally. Um, it's good to understand, yeah, what was behind their decision. I really hope that if the uh, traffic light system, you know, if we get down to green or something, that they might review it. And then I was also thinking about, like, Cambridge with the, the open air 50 metre pool, you know, where there was an option possibly to allow people that couldn't get their certificates or something that if it could be, you know, just accessed by them or something, you know, so that they didn't have to go inside or, or something. Yeah. yeah. Whether so or not it's an approach that could be taken to 
to try and accommodate um, you know non-vaccinated people yeah obviously um take on board feedback and and have can have those conversations um essentially though for for both of the facilities um all of their changing facilities are inside and there's no external facing facilities at um, peri aquatic center uh, so from that perspective you know the board has made the call um, based on that health and safety view and, and their staff and then also trying to operate under the protection framework. Um, we are, are not are not the only pools or council run um, facilities that's taken the stance, all of council, all of Auckland councils, recreation and aquatic facilities are following the same um, procedure as such. So it's we're not in isolation with Go Waipa. No. Okay, Th thanks very much. For you, Madam Chair, um, Sally, yeah, I, have, I have replied to this lady uh, much along those lines that uh, personally that I shouldn't we shouldn't interfere with the trust make with the trust decisions and that this is happening over a lot of facilities by other organizations as well but I haven't heard anything backwards so it's just a pretty common sense um, answer yeah also through the through the chair we have received um, a few questions through council which we are responding to um, we'll be responding to in terms of um, the go away part decision um, but I agree with the sentiments that Bruce has passed on there thank you great thanks for that thanks for clarifying Chair, Sally. Uh, Graham yeah the, um, I'll need to speak up front there's no way that I'm wanting 10 percent of those unvaccinated people telling 90% of the population where, what to do and, and try and run it. They've got to comply. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Um, any other questions there for, for Brad? Yeah, I have one for Brad. Um, Brad, we're, we're, getting, we're getting, you indicated vandalism uh, around the Waipuki area. Um, we have security cameras at the gate. We should have a hand on who's coming and who's going out. And also at Bulmers Landing, which is, you know, right up against the Waikato River, uh, just across from Arapuni, that is absolutely disgusting what's going on. And the vandalism has been beyond what we normally comprehend or, or what we see happening. Um, working with comms there is a chance to get some, I mean, there's only one road in. It's a chance to monitor all and sundry that do come in here. The problem is that with, you know, your, clearest, your, cl your closest police station is Tiamudu or Pratero. I'm not even sure if the battery's got a 24-7, but you're a long way from getting any help. Should, but that, the tearing up of that there is just unbelievable. Thanks. Yeah, look, I, I agree, Graham. It's absolutely disgraceful. Um, um, I've been doing a bit of work together with the Tilmusha Community Board um, uh, and Ange Holt, um, Mandy Merson, and I have hoping to catch up at some point with Ryan Fenoing. But just sort of maybe foreshadow the for um, that uh, that's potentially... Um, there's a potential measure there for us to discuss or consider in terms of um, our public places bylaw and the addition to that, um, to the schedule at the back, the inclusion of particular areas preventing what's known as cruising um, by, by vehicles. So it kind of uh, and, uh, commences the process of um, being able to take um, it's sort of punitive action, if you like, against people who are um, behaving in an antisocial manner in those places. But look, I agree, Graham. It's an absolute disgrace. Those photos are just heartbreaking, and it's certainly not um, certainly an escalation of what we've seen in years gone by. Um, and you know, it's it's not gone unnoticed by residents who have had enough, who are beginning to fear for their safety, um, whose uh, you know, peaceable enjoyment of their homes and and um, districts is, is really um, being challenged and, and I think we need to really seriously look at what we can do as a council to help those communities feel safer and to protect our, um, yeah. our reserves and public places for the benefit of the whole community. So look, um, it's a massive topic, but um, I just thought I'd, I'd, um, I'd back you up there, Graham, in terms of your, your horror and disgust around what's been going on. So a couple of hands have gone up there, Liz and then Marcus. Thanks. Um, sorry, I thought Marcus would be before me. <laughs> hey, a um, couple of things, Brad. Um, first of all, just the, the new smoke and vape free public places, um, you know, the, the policy that we created only a few months ago. And I appreciate that 
Um, obviously, there's been a lot going on, but I wondered how we were um, actually engaging with a lot of our um, public about those new rules that, are, that have come in. About, and I'm, I'm talking about signage, which I thought was probably going to go out there, but I haven't seen much of it. Um, especially in some of our parks and reserves that might be out in our rural areas. Just wondered if that was, um, yeah, going to start rolling out at some point. You're on mute, Brad. <laughs> Sorry about that, rookie mistake. Um, thanks, Councillor Stowick. Yes, uh, we do have a new signage um, suite we're going to be starting to implement as part of our renewal programme. Um, at the same time, we're taking, um, we're looking to implement uh, Te Reo Māori names onto some of that new signage as well. So, and, and bilingual. So we're working with Mana Whenua at the moment on those. Um, and as they become available, we'll start rolling them out. Um, and that will have the new, um, the new, 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 uh, new um, smoke-free um, icons um, on there as well. Um, so we, we do have that. We don't have any specific that we've got at the moment going out around those those pieces of work but as i said through the renewal program um and and in the development program we've got for a new signage we will be um highlighting that mm. i just don't think anyone knows <laughs> that's all and we've created this and we spent obviously graham spent a lot of time on it and i just don't think anyone knows that uh, apart from the odd little note in the paper that that we've actually got this in place but anyway hey um and just my other question was around dominion ave and i know um uh, Councillor Webber has uh, mentioned it previously, and I'm not expecting anything to be done overnight, but I think that is a space um, that I know uh, Cambridge councillors are really, really keen to see um, an improvement in, in Dominion Ave and the space. Um, so I was wondering whether it might be possible to, to talk about getting a um, just a, a group together, a even you know community group together, who might be keen to take a bit of ownership around that area, particularly local neighbours and things. Is that specifically Riverside Reserve? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so yep. we do we do have um, a piece of work going on there as well as part of our renewal program. Um, we're looking to um, shore up the the boat ramp, um, which has been scaled out at the moment, plus improve some of the area around the viewing platform, um, and potentially link up the footpath there as well. So we do have um, plans in, in in foot for that site, um, including trying to um, get that driveway improved as well. Is that in this year's program, Matt? Sorry. That's, that's correct, yep. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll just something to add to that, because I've got Marcus and Jim as well, but if, it, if you've got some comments to make in respect of the Dominion discussion. Yes. Yep, yes. go for yep. it. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I support uh, what uh, Liz just mentioned as well, and, and local fishermen as well um, love that area down there, and they've commented about how, how terrible it is down there or how untidy it is and what have you, so I'd support that too. Thank you. Great, thanks, Phil. Okay, Marcus, then Jim. Um, yeah, Brad, I was just wondering, with the vandalism stuff happening at the boat ramps um, and like Waipuki Park, is there going to be um, a tie-in at all with the works that we're doing around upgrading those areas, um, like, you know, at Arapuni and, and Katapiro and all the other boat ramps we have around the place? So we, we currently do have a, a work programme this, for this financial year for um, Pukimako, Bumas Landing, Gaslight Theatre and um, Temuru Cemetery, which has been our hotspots over the last little while. Um, and, and those do include a range of measures from installing security cameras, which will feed live into the, the ComSafe team there, um, speed bumps, um, some signage and some, some new gating. So we do have that in place and planned already. Um, obviously, Bulma's Landing will be the key one there um, with a, if we can get a couple of cameras there, which obviously captures the content of the vandalism, but also number plate recognition. We've been working a little bit with the police, um, Constable Ryan Fleming on this, and they're really supportive because um, as soon as we can capture that, we can start, start impounding some of those vehicles. Um, we then do have, I, I know Tafik is in a previous workshop, um, started highlighting some of the concept plans that we're looking to do for these lakeside reserves. I, I guess that might be an opportunity there that, that we can start to um, include some of that work. Um, there's nothing funded at the moment for anything further. Um, in fact, the, the security work that we're doing for this current financial, we've had to realign some of the, the, the budgets um, to, to find that. So um, yeah, we, we're very keen to work and support with the communities and um, 
anyone at this table to you know sort of implement that but it's just a case of um yeah, we're working through the the right avenues, I guess, so we can get some funding for it um, through the next long long term plan. Yeah, can I just add to that too, Brad? The Pukiatua community have been really active in um, fundraising over the last um, several years, and they've actively raised uh, like tens of thousands of dollars themselves in order to install their own um, set of uh, of um, cameras. Um, they haven't quite gone up yet. I understand Terry Johnson. The chap who's in charge of it all has has all the gear ordered and paid for, but we're, of course COVID's um, been a bit of a beggar there in terms of those supply mm. chain issues. So you know you've got a community who's really passionate and prepared to pull together and act um, uh, for the benefit of their community. And I think it's really important as council we show them um, as much um, support as we as we are able. Um, yeah. So thanks for that. So Brad. can I just chip in on that just while it's right. topical, please? Yeah, Brad, could I suggest you bring the camera? When you go off Bulmers Landing Road, it's an intersection between the Rotonato Road and the Tiamudu Arapuni Road, and it's very, very visible in the public eye. It also has uh, power on that corner, uh, the main feeder lines, and I was wondering whether that may have been the place to put something high up on a power pole rather than have the destruction down by Bulmers Landing where people can't see them. And I know, you know, they've got a camera, they, you know, but they seem to, to vandalise it. Um, there is a couple of entrances down there to farms. You'd soon sort the farm staff out from the ones that are going out to do the vandalism. But it's only a suggestion that may may help. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Weber. We'll take that feedback on board. Yeah, I think they've got 10 to go. I'm just looking at my notes. They raised over $20,000 and sought um, and received a grant from Trust Power. So it's taken them two and a half years. So it's pretty fine example of a community acting um, uh, to try and keep its peaceful enjoyment of its district intact. Um, Jim, you've been waiting for yeah. Oh, no, that, that's right. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, look, just quickly and not wanting to extend the discussion on something this negative, but I'd received uh, a number of complaints myself and spoke to the area commander um, there and... Um, as I understand it, they have been doing some work out there recently and have already impounded a couple of cars. So uh, Will Laughlin had organised that. So I really want to, um, um, I suppose, thank him for the work that they're doing because, as you rightly say, the uh, residents out there were feel, uh, fearing for their own safety. You know, you had boy racers shooting fire rack, um, crackers and rockets at people's private dwellings and things. So the police are definitely trying to assist there. So, um, Brad, I've got a direct call, um, a phone number for Jeff Penno, who's the air, acting area commander. If you haven't got it, I can give it to you off, great, offline. Yep. So, um, yeah, but they're definitely trying to get out there and, and try and control it as well as they can. But as has already been pointed out, uh, it's a long distance away from a police station, which is a, a challenge. Mm. Yeah. And, and I'll just add to that, Jim, unfortunately, although um, uh, Patararo might be the closest, as the crow flies, that's not the way that these... Um, that the chains of command work in terms of making reports. If it's in Waipa, it goes straight to your Tilmutu, which station, which is much further. So unfortunately, that's not giving us any faves. And I suspect our boy racing community know that. So uh, Andrew. Thanks, Susan. Uh, and on a completely different subject, the um, Te Awamutu War Memorial Park's looking absolutely magnificent at the moment, Brad. Um, it's just a pleasure to walk through and um, your, your team and the, and the uh, volunteer groups done a great job there. Um, but I have had a, a, a comment about the curb walkway and wondering when that is due for a repaint. So um, I don't expect you to know offhand, but if you could flick me an email as to when that's scheduled in, that'd be great. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Andrew. Now, I think that probably brings to a conclusion the discussion around that item. We have a recommendation there to um, accept um, Brad's report. Have I somebody felt you happy to move? Lou's happy to second. Um, all those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Fantastic. Look, great. Thank you very much, um, Brad. And pass on our thanks to your team, would, um, if you wouldn't mind. It's, it's not been easy for them. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Cheers.
So that takes us on to our next item, which is the arts policy, public art acquisition, Leamington Domain. And I believe Anne Blythe should be here to present this one. Oh, good morning, Anne. I see you there now. Good Welcome. morning. Thanks, Madam Chair. Kia ora tato. Um, so the purpose of, of this report is to provide some information and to seek approval for a public art installation. Um, in accordance with WIPAR's arts policy. So the proposed mural will be located on an, an existing structure, which is screening the storage for the Cambridge Lions Club miniature trains on the Leamington domain. And the aim of the mural project is to provide a dual benefit through softening the, the hard landscaping that's present there, uh, as well as deterring any potential um, tagging and graffiti. And the mural will also provide the park users there with a community-based artwork, um, which will include depictions of native flora and fauna overlaying um, a map of the Waikato River. So since our last very brief airing at the SPMP meeting, um, we have, uh, staff have virtually met with the Cambridge Community Board Chair and, the, and a representative from the Cambridge Model Engineering Society. Uh, and uh, we shared the proposal and received feedback from, from them. And subsequently, the uh, art was endorsed at a meeting of the Cambridge Community Board at their 3rd of November meeting. So I can take the reporters read and more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Anne. Do we have any questions there? Um, Marcus and then Liz. Um, hi, Anne. Hey, I'm um, just wondering, um, why is this coming out of uh, that budget instead of the community board putting some money towards it or the Creative Communities Fund, which we've just had our funding round on? That is a, a very good question. Um, I'm not sure if Sally might be in a better position to answer that or Brad. Um, kia ora. Uh, yeah, so we, this, was, this was engaged by, by council. This piece, piece of work that wasn't led by the community board as such. That's probably something that we will look closely to work more closely with them on um, for future art pieces. Um, but uh, yeah, this was come from our, our maintenance budget, especially around graffiti, um, instead of sort of uh, spending money on uh, removing or reactively removing graffiti, we were look, looking a bit more proactive in that space. Okay, so that's cool. But um, why wasn't there an application for, for the um, Creative Community Arts Fund? Um, pass, sorry, can't go. That's probably a good piece of feedback that we can take on board for next time. It's a, it's a fair um, question to, to ask, Adam, Marcus. Can I, can I just Sorry. answer? We were, the Combs Community Board was completely left out of any discussion when the council hired an artist from Parongia to do some work there. And it was a complete oversight. We, we completely understand um, what happened. But since then, the, the um, council, Matt and his team, have, have been good at coming back to us. So there was no indication, Marcus, that, that, that this was ever going to be coming forward. Can I ask, well, when is the artwork due to be installed or, or commissioned? Uh, I'd pr probably be January now. Um, time's running out in, in December, so it'd be, be January start. Because I think we still have funds available in the creative, in our, in our um, arts grants. Is, is anybody from Coms able to have a check? Is January around at the moment? Mm, okay. Well, 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 maybe, maybe I, I, I would not be, um, I would not want to fund this from our uh, existing, from your existing budgets. When I think that there is actually money that we have available from other sources that you could apply for and get grants for, rather than using your own budget that we could use for, you know, graffiti removal. Okay. I'm inclined to agree. Um, Liz, and then Alwyn. <laughs> Um, hey, thank you, um, Susan. Hey, so I was just going to just, um, I guess, acknowledge um, that, yeah, really, really great that Community Board have been involved um, and have approved this. But I guess going forward, um, it would be really great to see a diversity of artists. Um, so that I know I appreciate this, this This particular artist is extremely talented and I think uh, will be really great for this project. But there will be, um, I guess, projects going forward and just be great to see a bit more diversity um, around our district and, and more localism as well. So I just think that 
Uh, you know, there are some really good Cambridge artists and um, and I'm sure the same in Temuru and Porongia. And when you've got particular projects in your town, I think just having that real extra degree of localism um, would be pretty fantastic. So just uh, just another idea for next time. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Councillor Stolwick. That's something we'll definitely take on board. Mm. Our one. Yes, I did have a quick chat with Gina about the funding. And the next round is March. Um, that's when the applications will be accepted and funding out by about April. So the opportunity to do this would not work well in retrospect of its funding if you continue to go ahead with your project in January. If you delay it, you could apply, but certainly you can't complete and then go back and ask for funding. So that's just an option if you want to work with that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In, in, the, in, this, in this um, situation, I think if we if we could get support to progress with this one, then and then in future ones, we'll be very much cognizant of the fact that we need to. Well, there's other opportunities to to get funding um, for that. Um, it's probably an oversight on our part there. Sorry, but in, as it lies now, the the uh, the the background is all cleaned and sort of ready to go. We're um, just looking to push push go. Uh, if we if we did do that, it'd be a few additional costs and probably need another clean before we start or paint. Um, Claire and then Mariata. Um, thanks very much. Um, I was wondering actually whether council isn't allowed to apply, that they may not be eligible, you know, like it, because they administer the fund, it might not be appropriate for them to then be. Yeah, it's, it's appropriate. It's a public art thing by the, um, the, the Lions Club. So Lions Club could apply. Okay. Well, I, the, the other question I had was during the LTP deliberations, um, one of the suggestions that was agreed to that I put forward was that we have a policy where 1% of capital projects for community facilities would be devoted to public art. And I've not heard anything on where that sits at the moment. Now, I'm not saying that this particular project fits within that sort of framework, but I'd be really um, anxious to make sure that that policy is being worked on and can be in place so that when we do get going with some of our other community facilities capital projects, that we can take advantage of that and so be able to support our local artists. So has anyone got an update? Or could we have an update on that, please? Kirsty or Sally, either or. Uh, through the chair, um, we'll provide an, a response back to you regarding that um, policy around public art, um, Councillor St. Pierre. So we'll get a response back to you. Thanks, Sally. Mariata. Oh, I'm um, good to see everybody. Um, so I do you know, support at the moment what Marcus is saying, but very interested in what, um, you know, uh, you come back with Sally uh, with regard to what Claire has stated as well. Um, but um, I do also support what Liz has um, raised around the artists. I'm really keen. We've got um, a lot of, um, kahukura artists, particularly around the Leamington area, who are just super talented, world renowned, and um, and I think need to be, uh, you know, um, have that opportunity at least to um, to tono or to um, be able to put forward a, an application or whatever, or some or be available for arts artworks as well. And I know this is not just limited to Ngati Kuruki kahukura, but also our other hapu as well, they all have great um, artists connected and I'm wondering how these community boards are connecting up with, with the local Māori artists from um, within those particular hapu or rohe. That's what I needed to say there. Yeah, thank you, Mariata. Uh, Claire, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, sorry about that. I did check the eligibility uh, for the Creative Communities Art Schemes and it says what isn't eligible is local council projects. So I don't think we should be planning to make use of that, but I agree with all the other um, comments. It's okay. all in how you word it, Claire, and who applies. Okay. So I guess we're at, we're at a position here where we have a recommendation, and this is the second time this matter has come back to us. Obviously, the recommendation is structured such that the... Um, the, the on paragraph 2c that the, we approve the total spend from the parks general maintenance budget um, 
I guess um, I'm unsure whether the um, members are inclined at this point to support that measure or whether we ask um, Brad to go back and re uh, reinvestigate along the lines of what Alwyn has suggested. Um, so uh, perhaps the best way to move this forward is to ask to see if anybody is happy to move that recommendation as it currently appears. And if, it, if there is nobody, then we'll have to have a further discussion. Andrew, you're waving your hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, look, I'm happy to move the recommendation. I agree with what Marcus has said and, and what you've supported him to, but um, to defer, delay this for $12,000, which is a reasonably small amount of money uh, um, in, in the scheme of things, I think is, um, yeah, not cool for. So I'm happy to move. Happy, happy to see you. Mike is seconding. So um, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Or raise your hand. Aye. aye. Is there anybody against? No. So the, the, the recommendation and motion is passed. I guess just for, it's a, one of those for further reference um, in the future, we all, we all hear loud, loud and clear that perhaps there are other investigations that need to be made in terms of the provenance or locality, uh, localist, localism, should I say, of the, of the artist and perhaps fu uh, alternative funding streams to, to meet the costs of such work. And Claire's uh, request for further information around the, um, the uh, funding policies. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask what Claire's Susan. Well, um, I thought the point that Midiata made was really good. And perhaps we need to do a bit of work getting the names and specialities of local artists so that you know we're aware of who's out there and what they could do. Like, is is that a waste of time? You know, like I just thought it'd be a bit of groundwork so that we don't miss out on, um, I suppose, some really great people within the communities because um, the people that are involved, you know, might not be aware of them or something. Like, how can we support these people better? We've done this before with the new toilet block at the um, yeah. Centennial Park, where we went out on Facebook and asked for people to apply and, and, and you know express their interests for, for designing that. So that, I think that worked really well because then people were able to put forward you know an idea. So if I, if I can through the chair, um, I just think I very much appreciate everybody's feedback regarding um, us testing uh, this policy and bringing it through to um, the committee for, for discussion and endorsement. Um, very much noted that we will uh, look at those other opportunities um, in terms of expressions of interest or opening um, these any of these future projects wider, as well as looking at alternative funding opportunities. Um, I think it's been noted the, the, the key driver for this one was around a relatively large over 20 metre wall going into a park and to and, and, you know try and minimise the ongoing costs of that around graffiti etc so very much a good learning process for us and the team and we take on board those comments and do recognise that we can open these up to capture a wider um, um, portfolio of artists to be involved going forward that are local as well so thanks for that feedback and um, we'll definitely take that on board for the next time round oh Susan you're on mute Mike did you have something you wanted to add before I bring this matter to yeah, the mic? thanks yeah through the chair so with that criteria I mean Part of that criteria could be around localism, and, that, and some of that could be weighted, I guess, around you know real localism, um, just like it is for major infrastructure projects where you know localism, and white white part local, um, it, it is weighted slightly different to if they're outside of white pass. So that could be part of the effectively the new matrix. Yeah, great. Thank you for that, Mike. So. That matter then has been concluded. So it brings us on therefore to our next item on our agenda, uh, which is the memorandum of understanding between Partner Council's Three Waters campaign. And I believe Dawn is here to present her paper to us. Um, good morning, Dawn. 
Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the report um, in front of you today is outlining the opportunity uh, to join with a number of partner councils, um, led primarily by Timaru District, but, but across quite a number of partner councils to outline concerns over the government's recent, recent announcement, announcements around the Three Waters reform. And uh, the campaign is to convince the, the government to reconsider its, its current position. Um, and in favour of, of looking at maybe um, more appropriate options that, that suit uh, the, the outcomes that we're wanting to achieve for our, for our communities. Um, I understand Mr uh, Ken Morris is, is online and wants to uh, raise a comment around the actual recommendation in terms of the, the funding. Uh, my report inadvertently included the, a reference to the Merrill Re Relief Fund, which should have been the Merrill Discretionary Fund, so my apology for that, but I think Ken was just going to, to cover that item. Thanks, Dawn. Hi, Ken. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. And um, and through the chair, um, yeah, Dawn, you've um, you've you've raised the issue very, very appropriately. Um, so yeah, look at look, it is unfortunate that that reference was to the mural relief fund because um because in fact that is actually um it actually should have been um to the mural discretionary fund, as Dawn has just um just mentioned. Um so so um so chair, with your indulgence, um at, at the point that this um, recommendation is put, um I would um I would suggest that. That, um, that obviously the last line of um, recommendation B um, changes and it says funded from the mural discretionary fund budget. Um, and actually, furthermore, I'd actually suggest that we actually remove the reference to um, to the general ledger account. It's, um, it is um, quite unusual um, to be quoting a general ledger account in, um, in a resolution. Um, so I'd just say funded from the mural discretionary fund budget, full, full stop. Um, that, that would be my, my suggestion. Um, happy to um, happy to talk at, at any point um, later in this conversation if anyone wants um, wants any further information about that mural discretionary fund. Thanks, Ken. And Mike, you've got your hand up already. Um, yeah. So it was just yeah, how large is the mural discretionary fund? What? How much is left in it? I, uh, yes, so so through the chair, I can um, I can answer that. Um, so look, um, yeah, his um, his worship the mayor has um, has actually not been spending too much of that mural discretionary fund in, in recent years. Um, so 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 the allocation um, the allocation is reasonably small as you would expect for yeah for a fund of this um, of this nature. Um, so so the allocation into the um, into the current 2021 twenty two year was seventeen thousand two hundred. Um, however. Um, at the start of the year, um, due to um, due to historic underspend, um, yeah, we actually had um, had thirty one thousand nine hundred dollars of carry forward balances. Um, so at the start of the year, there was actually forty nine thousand or just over forty nine thousand dollars available. So 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 fairly small allocation each year, but quite considerable. Um, yeah, but built up carry yep. forward balances. Yep. No. Good. Good. There's plenty plenty left. That's what I was worried about. Thank you. Mike. Now, Lou and then Roger both have questions. Thank you. Through you, uh, you Madam Chair. Uh, just quickly to uh, ask the question, how many of councils have actually participated in this uh, object against uh, this piece of legislation? Maybe through you, Madam Chair, I can answer that. Uh, Dawn might not be aware. At the moment, there are 17 councils that have agreed to um, uh, contribute in, in a financial sense. Uh, a number of others are still going through the process of discussing it with the council. Um, so there's likely to be um, significantly more join up to this um, proposal, I suppose. Yeah. Through you, Madam Chair, the reason I asked that question was there's quite a lot of angst amongst the general public or ratepayers out there and a lot, a lot of knowledge over the three waters and what is what we're actually doing. And uh, I think that this is something perhaps if we can sort of emphasise or publicise this a little bit, that we are taking action or participating in some form of action. Yeah, the, the, um, Councillor Brown, um, that's one of the major um, focus um, areas of this group to actually get out to the public and actually put the uh, the facts as we see them out, out for the community to understand it rather than the advertising campaign that was done by central government. 
Thanks, Jim. Uh, Roger and then Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. No, my question was exactly the same as Lou's, an indication of the uh, local authorities that are actually intending to be signatures to that. Um, Jim, when do you expect all of those councils <coughs> excuse me, to actually confirm their signatory? And would the names of those be available to us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, the financial contribution, those names would be available now, Roger, um, uh, but there'll be more coming on, on board, um, hopefully shortly. Uh, but yeah, look, I can I can give you a list and we can keep updating that list as, as others join. And I would suspect that um, when the community starts discussing this uh, more, then other councils could well be pressured into uh, joining because there's a lot of disquiet out there that we are um, in the feedback we're getting. Yeah. And just on, on Lou's other point, as this is a a public meeting and this decision of ours to support this campaign will now be public, then the, uh, we can actually make sure that the word gets around to our community that we are taking this step. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Roger. So Andrew, Graham, Mariata, then Mike. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I, uh, I think everyone probably knows my views on this subject. Um, and I'm not going to try and relitigate them here, except to say that while I accept if water services remain within council, we may well be able to achieve some efficiencies. I do not believe we will get anywhere near the efficiencies that a larger organisation would achieve, which means that every water connected ratepayer is going to be paying more and I believe significantly more for their water than they would if we went with the government's proposal. So I will be voting against this recommendation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Graham. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I um, just wanted to be a little bit grumpy. I think it's unacceptable that the recommendations weren't finalised before they went out on the agenda. That's not rocket science. We had senior people looking at that. And to come back at the 11th hour and have that change, not a big deal. Um, we're all uh, familiar with the, the relief fund, but um, in my view, if we're going to be the home of champions, we should be making sure that those re resolutions are correct in the first place. Yeah, th thank you, um, Graham. I'm a bit of a stickler for accuracy myself, to be fair, so I... I, I I certainly find some your points are, are well made. Um, Mariata and then Mike. Kia ora, no. just a quick question from me. Um, many discussions been occurring within the uh, Iwi Consultative Committee or with you know, Iwi Tōpū regarding this position. Through, through you, Madam Chair, at, at this time, no, this proposal, I, I don't believe, has been presented to the Iwi Consultative Committee or Na Iwi Tōpō or Waipa. Is it appropriate that it should be? Yeah, look, uh, from my point of view, Mariata, it has been dis has been discussed. Um, the Three Waters has been a topic on the agenda on uh, regular uh, meetings. Um, this uh, funding coming from, um, from the mayoral fund um, was um, a call that I made because of uh, expediency, I suppose, in terms of trying to uh, uh, get the uh, support of YPA uh, through, to the, through to the group. So look, absolutely want to keep um, um, Iwi involved in, in the discussion. And we've had uh, discussions with Waikato Tainui, I suppose, in, in terms with talking with Linda about the, uh, the reforms and, um, and particularly from uh, a, uh, a future-proof perspective, Waikato, uh, Hamilton City and ourselves. 
So uh, look, um, this is just to get a, an organisation up and running and provide some financial assistance, but there'll be a, a, a need for a lot of conversations, I would suggest, going forward. Thanks for that, Jim. Mike. Yeah, thank you through the chair. Um, yeah, look, um, a couple of points that I've got to make. Uh, yeah, one is, uh, you know, the alliance of, of 17 plus councils are not asking that reform doesn't happen. What they're asking for is a pause and to be consulted around what that reform looks like. So I personally have no issue with that. I've got two questions. If the council approved this today, would any future public meetings, and Roger sort of started the conversation, we were looking at organising one as sort of Cambridge Council as an unofficial meeting, I guess. Would that, would those, can those meetings now be led by council and council staff, et cetera? That's my first question. From my perspective, absolutely, Mike. It's, um, as this is really giving council backing to the, to the new group that's being formed. So uh, obviously want to keep everybody informed, um, councillors and, and the community. So absolutely. Yeah, all right. Thank you for that. Um, and just at those meetings, you know, some of the feedback we got was, hey, you know, do when we do that, and that they asked us, is present a sort of balanced view. It's not all sort of skewed so I thought hey that's fair and reasonable my second question is if there's private funders of um of which we we, we know there is at least you know, one or two big private funders we possibly would like to give money to to this to, to support this um is that possible to be given to this group yeah so at the moment uh, that issue hasn't been discussed by the group. Um, I've received one um, verbal offer along those lines. Um, at the moment, the group is trying to maintain its uh, um, autonomy, I suppose, and doesn't want to be seen to be influenced by necessarily maybe pressure groups. Um, I'm not saying that the individuals would be in that category, but it, uh, so it's a possibility, but it hasn't been discussed as yet. Could I just ask Jim that the next time the group meets that that could be agended just so we do get a response to, to that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Marcus. Um, I'd just like to say that I support um, Andrew's comments um, before, and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not feeling very comfortable about this because it seems like the whole waters thing that we did a few years ago, um, we were going around in circles again. Um, shouldn't this be something that like LGNZ um, puts together and, and supports us in doing rather than councils doing it by themselves? Uh, again, if I can comment through you, Madam Chair, the um, uh, LGNZ has tried to... Um, influence, I suppose, the decision of central government, but entered into a, a memorandum of understanding um, with, with central government and agreed in that, in short, I suppose, not to um, work actively against what the um, DIA came up with the, with the final solution, the four entities. So effectively, the group is really being formed because they don't believe that LGNZ is representing the views of the community. And um, unfortunately, the MOU tends to tie LGNZ's hands, uh, the MOU between um, LGNZ and, and DIA. So this uh, group has really formed because of frustration that they don't believe, that, and I would support it, they don't believe that our concerns have been listened to. And in terms of transfer of assets or, or uh, appropriation of community assets um, is, is not um, appropriate, I suppose, uh, without due uh, compensation and recognition of those community assets. That's one of the 
real issues that that is driving this. Um, certainly, the uh, this new group that's being formed believe that there needs to be improvements to our drinking water standards and and waste discharge standards, um, but that we need to identify where the problems are and focus our attention on fixing those problems rather than a one size fits all across the across the country. So. Um, Certainly, I would have said initially that it's an LGNZ-driven uh, um, responsibility, if you like, because they're a, a membership organisation that relies on, on councils uh, throughout the country. Um, at the moment, the only council that's withdrawn from LGNZ uh, feels so strongly about the, the lack of uh, support from LGNZ as Timaru. A number of other councils have talked about it, but they've decided to remain um, in, a, in the membership of LGNZ, but feel that they need to take this step um, just because we're, on this issue at the moment alone, um, we don't feel that LGNZ is uh, pushing uh, our perspective in, in terms of the concerns that the community has. Thanks for that clarification, Jim. Look, I think um, this is a, such a... Oh, Lou, final comment? Just quickly, uh, with this uh, piece of legislation, there's quite a lot of problems with things like stormwater and the actual ownership of land. The ownership issue is possibly, to me, the most important thing here, is that they're declaring that they've got the assets, but they're not actually allowing us the actual say or the rights of ownership. And we've got lots of floodplains and areas out there that are considered storm areas or storm water areas that have to be considered. And I think that there's a lot of issues here that haven't been resolved as far as we're concerned as councillors to make a accurate and a good decision on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lou. I, I, I agree with that. Um, there's still a lot of detail that needs to be worked through, and everybody accepts that, uh, um, even the, uh, the proposed um, new entities understand that there's going to be a, a, the devils in the detail, I suppose. So um, whatever way you look at it, um, there still needs to be a lot of work um, undertaken to actually identify just what assets we're talking about being transferred. Look, I suppose um, just quickly, uh, Susan, not wanting to prolong the discussion, but my approach to this has always been uh, we're elected to look after the best interests of, of WIPA ratepayers. And I know that our ratepayers move around the country and they go on holidays and, and maybe drinking water in locations that haven't got the same standard that we've got. But my approach has always been uh, I'm here and been elected to look after the best interests of WIPA ratepayers. And, and if I thought that we were going to get a, uh, uh, a more efficient and a more effective uh, system out of the reforms, then I'd be supporting it. I just don't believe that that's the case. And WIPA has invested heavily in its infrastructure. And this new proposal will mean that we are going to be um, compensating other areas that haven't done the same. So uh, in a national, um, pers well, from a national perspective, Andrew may well be right that we'll be paying uh, more for our water. Um, but from uh, WIPAS perspective will be almost guaranteed to be paying more because there are areas around the country that definitely have underspent and need to come up to standards. So those councils that have already invested will be paying twice. And I don't think that's fair on, on our rate pass. Yeah, thank you. thanks, Jim. Hey, look, we could um, talk on this point for quite some time, as I know we're all fairly passionate about it. However, I'm just mindful of our time constraints today. So um, with that said, we have um, a recommendation there appearing on page 52 of our agenda, 
Um, subject to the change um, in terms of reference to the um, funding source being the mayoral discretionary fund, um, can I have in, um, somebody move that? Roger, you're moving. Lou, you're seconding. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? No. Yeah, Andrew's against. And you want to be recorded, don't you, Andrew? Yes, please. Excellent. Marcus, were you against or did you want to be recorded? You're all good. Okay, excellent. Okay. So on that basis, um, the, uh, the motion has been successful and um, that brings that item to a conclusion. Thank you very much, Ken and um, Dawn, for assisting us with that. And also, obviously, Jim, for um, being able to give us some real insight into um, other councils around um, the country in terms of their views. So moving on then to the next item, which is um, the National Policy Statement on Urban Development and Housing Bottom Lines. And I believe we have Mr. Topman, Topman. Mr. Topman here for us with us. Good morning, David. Nice to see you. Morning, Madam Chair. Kia ora tato, councillors. Good to see you. I've okay. had a haircut. <laughs> the joys of haircuts. Um, look, mine's a short report. Hopefully uh, you've had a chance to have a read of it. It's really just a, a one for information, your information, and it's just to let you know we've had to do a well, we have to do a mandatory change to our district plan. That's our rule book um, to comply with the national policy statement on urban development. Um, the national policy statement on urban development requires us to have in our district plan a statement regarding what they call housing bottom lines. And that's simply our kind of minimum developable, feasible, and realizable housing capacity that we have. So it's something that's already in the district plan. It was a requirement of the previous national policy statement for urban development capacity. It sits in our strategic uh, policy framework section, the very first section in the district plan. There's a little table in there and it's got some figures which were required by the previous NPS, as I said. So we put that in back in 2018. This is an update because we've now done our second um, capacity assessment, just recently completed in July this year. So this, this report is just simply to inform you, we will be updating our district plan. Um, we hopefully are doing that before the end of the year. And we're also, just for your information, doing this in conjunction with our future group partners. So we're all doing it at a similar time period to um, enable an update to the NPS because the, sorry, not the NPS, the regional policy statement also has to be updated and they, they need to do that once the, the district plans of Hamilton City, Waikata District Council and Waikata District Council have been updated. So that's my report in essence, if there are any questions. Excellent. Short and sweet. Thank you, David. Um, Lou and Roger both have questions for you though. Thank you, well, through you, Madam Chair, was I first or was I first? Yeah, thank you very much, through yeah. you, Madam Chair. Just quietly, um, have we resolved the issue of whether Waipa and Waikato District are Tier 1? Um, there was always a, a little bit of thought that yeah. we perhaps are unfortunately bound into this yeah. from, uh, you know, by legislation. And I do think that, you know, uh, areas we've got within our uh, development we certainly wouldn't want to be tier one or considered tier one in some of those developments. I'm thinking of smaller rural areas, Prongy, et cetera, mm -hmm. and Harpo. Through you, Madam Chair, there are two aspects to that question, Councillor Brown. Um, we, in terms of the NPS, we are listed as a tier one authority, so it's black and white, it's in there. We are a tier one authority. But I think your question is really about the there's a distinction between tier one urban environments and tier two and tier three. And that's where the issue has come in. Um, what is a tier one? What is a tier two? What is a tier three? And if you read the NPS urban development, tier one are our five cities in New Zealand. So Auckland, Hamilton, Taranga, Wellington, Christchurch. And so in Waipa, we have Cambridge and Chiamudu, 
which are not cities, they're towns, they're tier three, but we butt onto Hamilton. So by virtue of boundary with Hamilton, we are considered a tier one uh, authority. It's not an easy fit answer, sorry. A little bit untidy, isn't it? Right, Roger. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, David. Yeah, I realise this is a requirement for us to put in. My understanding, however, is that if you look at the, uh, the growth cells that we've got across the region um, prior to 2035, we probably well exceed that figure of uh, 4,100. Um, so this is going in there just as a minimum? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And, and that is on a reading that there, certain growth cells would be developed before 2035 and others after then. But as you said, we could bring them forward if need be. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that, David. Look, I think um, that brings a discussion on that item to a conclusion. We have there on uh, par, uh, page 59 of our agenda um, recommendation to both receive um, David's report and to and note the mandatory changes he's discussed to us with us. Um, do I have some? Yeah, Andrew's happy to move. Uh, clear as seconding. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Fantastic. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much, David. Thank you. Now, moving on then to our next item, which is the Waikato Bat Alliance and Waikato Regional Bat Strategy. It's so exciting. Uh, <laughs> Julie, Julie Hanson, you're here. To, I sort of, I don't know, the feel a bit like Catwoman or something when I, Bat Alliance. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to you and to all councillors. Um, yes, it is kind of exciting, if a little bit, you know, weird. Um, what my report today is about is to uh, inform you that um, Waipa District Council, policy staff and reserve staff have been working together with um, staff from Waikato Regional Council, Hamilton City and Waikato District, Department of Conservation and uh, Mana Whenua on a BAT strategy. So we've been working on this for a year or more and so we're presenting it to you today with some uh, with an outline of bats, where they are in Waipa District, what they need to thrive, um, and what the risks to them are in our district and what our next steps might be. So um, you might know that the long-tailed bat is one of New Zealand's only native land mammals, and you might also know that it recently won the Bird of the Year competition, which is um, interesting. Controversial, so, controversial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is classed as a nationally critical um, species, wildlife species. So while the council itself does not have a mandate to protect the bat itself, um, we do are required under the RMA to protect um, habitats of nationally significant wildlife or indigenous fauna. Um, the problem is, is that often bats don't live in our na um, native bush areas. They can roost in old pine trees and, um, you know, and they're often the ones that are on farms that are being felled for subdivision and, and that sort of thing. So that's where the issue arises for uh, Waipa. So in my report, I show, um, which is page three of my report, but page 65 of the agenda, there's a map there showing the um, distribution and our, the known locations of long-tailed bats in our district. So you can see there's a real concentration of them around um, the Tamahiri area, like the side of the river around the Narrows, um, close to Mount Porongia and Mangakawa and Timiro, and some around Mangatautari. So they're that's not the full extent of it. That's just what we know about because there's never been a real um, comprehensive survey done of the areas where they are located. This is just information that's been provided to us by the Waikato Regional Council, Department of Conservation. And as people have applied for resource consents and they've had to supply ecological information and it's been mapped for us. Um, further through the report you can see that um, what 
the, what bats need to thrive. So they need mature trees, they need darkness, they need productive foraging grounds and flyways between all their roosting areas. They want connectivity. They need predator control and um, they need big, large landscapes and open spaces. So as I mentioned before, land development and subdivision is one of the main, one of the three main threats to bat habitat and ecology. So with our rapid um, development, not just in Waipa, but on the edges of Hamilton City and in Waikato District, um, there's pressure to increase land development and build houses. Um, but that can create other issues. So you may be aware recently of an environment court case for the Peacock subdivision or the Amberfield subdivision where um, the court decided in favour of more protection for the long-tailed bat. <coughs> and um, so that's that was an interesting outcome there. So tree felling, especially of um, big old trees that are not native, they're not protected in any way, but that can have a significant effect on bat habitat and of course the good old predators that um, predate on everything including bats. So Madam like Peck, I mentioned... Can I just ask a question of Judy please? Yes. Just yeah. on that point. Uh, 3.6.1 uh, the um, intensification and clearing of forest for dairy intensification is wrong. That is not happening. You need a resource consent now to have a dairy conversion and that would not be allowed to happen. The other thing that I found missing in here was, who is doing the predator control? There's nothing in there that says, why can a regional council are doing the predator, con predator control? And if I had looked at this, well, and I looked at this report, if I had been part of this report, I would definitely not have disclosed the areas where these bats were. I think it'd be, it's detrimental. We have a falcon nest very close to Cambridge and we've been very, very uh, precious about actually identifying exactly where that is for obvious reasons. Okay, thank you. Point taken. Um, the dairy conversion comment probably came straight out of the bat strategy, which is for the wider Waikato region. And yes, you're right, um, consents are now needed to do that. But in other areas, that is probably still going on in other districts. I didn't want that overlooked because, you know, we're, we're, taking, a, we're taking a hammering on, on all fronts on farming. And to actually have this not, that not sort of um, explained in it, that that, okay. you know, could or is not no longer happening. Um, it would have, I just feel that it's very important that we don't get whacked with that um, overall policy. Because um, particularly in Waipa, we've had a very good buy-in from farmers and staff into protecting a lot of those precious areas. And people have been on board absolutely fabulous. Not a, it's not a slash and burn situation at all, Julie. Yeah. Sorry to be. Sorry. No, thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> I echo your sentiments, Graham, wholeheartedly. Bruce, have you got a, a point to add there? Um, Julie, just once, uh, uh, do we have to get an ecological report just to fell pine trees? As I, I know a case not far away from me with a, a stream, there's pine trees, there's some old ones. So is that a requirement now before you actually do any milling or clearing? I don't think so. Um, possibly a consent planner would be better to um, answer okay. that question for you. Uh, Tony, if he's online, may be able to um, assist with that. I think it's often a um, for some of the bigger subdivisions and developments, they have to do that anyway, is provide some ecological and archaeological and soil tests and all those sorts of things. And that's like a, a side thing. And so we've just collected the information that way. Um, I'm not sure it's a requirement to, you know, if you're wanting to cut down a shelter belt of trees and they're not protected in any way, then no, there is no requirement um, for a resource consent to do that. Mm. Oh, I know that we Oh, sorry, I know where the field days are on the corner coming up that hill. Those pine trees council want we want to remove those, but there were bats in existence. So mm. that's you know to tidy it all up really. But so I don't know what happened about that. Yeah. But, mm. So I'm happy to clarify. So I think there was there's also the BBC Technologies one opposite sort of area space where there's some trees there that may have had bat roosting in them which weren't part of the resource application. So part of the problem the or part of the challenge that we've got is a district plan 
doesn't protect, so it only has a very limited range of protection on, on indigenous biodiversity. And you know the, the sort of old man pines and the macrocarpas and those sorts of things aren't protected. But typically, as, as Julie said, and, and as the bat group is saying, a lot of those are actually roosts of a protected and threatened species. So we're in a situation, we've had discussions with DOC where um, they have strongly encouraged us as a council because we manage and control land use, that when an application comes in for a land use or a subdivision, and we suspect that there may be some bat roosting, but as a matter of course, we go back to the applicant and say, can you please do some ecological investigations to confirm? It's, it's quite a vulnerable situation because we don't have any legal controls over that. And as we saw with BBC, it was entirely within their rights to clear fill those pine trees. So we didn't have the opportunity there to, to see whether there was bat roosting and we've got no mechanism to enforce that. And so that's why I think this group has got together to see if there's a, I guess, a solution around that. Thank you. I, I kind of got to add to that ironic therefore that it's dairy intensification that's blamed for given the two examples that we have before us today have nothing to do with dairy farming. But anyway, I digress. Uh, Jim, did you have a... Sorry about that, Madam Chair. Yeah, look, uh, a question I was going to ask was how much more is this going to cost um, uh, um, applicants for a resource consent for, for a start off? And if we're protecting the bats in the public interest, should we, as the council, if we're imposing it, whether it's us or the regional council, be funding the environmental assessment on... on um, the impact, I suppose, of, of felling pine trees, because I think, or macrocarpa or whatever they are, because I think um, uh, if there's a, a cost associated with it, then there may well be people that will cut down these trees before they actually make a, an application. I certainly would, because you just don't want to um, risk those the potential costs that you, you're you going to run into. So, um, yeah, so I suppose my question is, how much is this going to cost the average uh, uh, applicant to actually get a, an environmental impact assessment done um, to actually maybe only cut down one tree? Um, I can have a go, Julie, if you like. Okay, I'm thanks, not sure what standard, standard cost is, um, Your Worship, I but I'd be imagining, Chris, it's in the order of sort of two, three thousand dollars for an ecological assessment, a fairly straightforward one. Um, we can't impose that, so all we can do is request it. So, so because we don't have a rule, um, we can request that as further information, but we can't actually require it as a condition of consent. Um, but the other point I'd make there too is that bats are a, are a threatened species under the Wildlife Act, and so anyone who, I guess, knowingly destroys a habitat of a threatened species, faces prosecution under the Wildlife Act, which DOC administer as well. And so we have pushed that back on DOC and we've said, look, you know, council can only do so much, but actually we're not the entity that administers the Threatened Species Act. And so um, we've actually asked DOC to step in, into that space a little bit more, rather than just relying on council to, I guess, enforce something that we can't actually enforce. So there's ongoing discussions around that. Yeah, so I suppose, and look, I'm I'm totally in um, support of looking after our in, endangered um, species, but I think we're going to get a lot more protection if we're a little bit more cooperative and instead of trying to uh, uh, force these costs on onto individuals, uh, we're protecting the species for the public good. So the public should be looking to put their hand in their pocket, whether that's DOC, us or the regional council, and encouraging people to actually uh, get out there and have a look and see uh, if they've got uh, what they suspect is bats uh, roosting in whatever trees on their property. And they could ring up one of those agencies and say, I, I suspect we've got these uh, uh, bats in our locality, um, would somebody like to come out and confirm one way or the other and tell us what we can do to, to maintain them rather than uh, look to whack them with another condition on their consent application, um, which may or may not protect those um, bats in this case? 
Um, can I just respond to that, please, Madam Chair? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mayor Jim. One of the, um, in, in the back of the report, so we've got a list of initiatives and um, um, priority actions that the BAT Alliance together has worked on. And one of them is um, just to research and monitor where the BATs are. It's not necessarily that we want to put rules in the plan straight away. It may come as a result of finding that people are just disregarding things anyway. Um, but certainly our own reserves department, they already give out information to people to try and help them avoid um, being in breach of the Wildlife Act. So it's kind of get, making them aware of what they might have on their property to help them avoid making those sorts of mistakes. I think what the Bad Alliance is really looking to do is to just um, generate awareness of the long tail bats and where they might be found so that people, when they're planning to do something, they say, oh, aha, yes, but what about the bats? And they can factor that into what they're doing. And it may be they can still cut down their trees, but at a certain time of the year, as opposed to, you know, right now, um, it's about, yeah, just managing the risk to the bats and, and helping us to um, look after them without necessarily... Um, slapping resource consent conditions on everybody who wants to cut down an old pine tree. Really, the biggest problem with this issue is that you can't see these things. Very difficult yeah. to identify them in the daylight. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, I, we, I think we've got Chris Brocklebank on the line too. So she's our council arborist and um, she may like to just briefly tell you what she helps um, council staff with plus private arborists and, and when they come to ask her questions. Are you there, Chris? Uh, yes, good morning. Yes, so currently in Waipa, when we're removing council trees, I do an initial assessment myself to see if they could meet the criteria for being a high risk of being a bat habitat. And if they are, then we do need to engage an ecologist to make an assessment because the rules with DOC are not that you can't remove a habitat that bats are in, but that you can't harm the bats. So if you know that a tree is a bat habitat, you can't remove that tree until those bats have moved on. So bats are very transient and they move around a lot. So there's, there's some difficulty with that for DOC because that doesn't actually protect that habitat, it just protects the bats. So, what we have to do um, to make sure that we're not breaking the DOC requirements and harming any bats is make an assessment of trees prior to their removal. And if there's bats in them, then, as Julie said, that may affect the timing of the work that has to be done. So currently, that's done pretty much on an ad hoc basis because we don't have a lot of spatial data about where the bats are because there hasn't been thorough surveying done across the region. So one of the things that has been identified as an action point with the BAT strategy is to get more spatial data and more surveying done across the region, which would be really helpful uh, for all the councils for both um, removal of council trees and also private trees, because having more information about where BATs are likely to be resting is a great starting point um, to identify whether or not trees are at risk of hosting BATs. Um, so that's really what we're doing now, but there's quite a few action points identified in that bat strategy, which would actually really support Waipa District Council. The idea is pooling resources and um, collaborating, but also looking to provide training for arborists so that ecologists don't always have to be engaged to do that assessment um, to establish if bats could be present in a tree and um, looking at increasing public awareness. So they're all things that would support WIPA and the other councils. And a lot of the conversation has been around where DOC's responsibility is, where the regional council can help, and then where the district council and city council um, step in. So it's been a really collaborative approach from all of those different areas. And there's still lots, lots further to discuss. This is quite a um, quite an early stage in the process, even though it's taken a while to get there. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, Claire, did you have a question? Oh, well, I was really just wanting to say that I'm, I'm really supportive of the approach that's been taken 
by the strategy because although there's been discussion about the the risk that it's actually going to create a lot of costs for people wanting to cut down trees or needing resource consents my understanding is that by taking the collaborative approach some of that um, monitoring some of that sort of data collection may actually be done by other entities and that might become a database that would be available you know that that's sort of detailed enough full wide path so that people would have a good idea whether or not they are likely to their property might be in a fly zone or something or not, you know, and that if, if more people are trained to be able to identify bats, um, such as the arborists, that you don't need to pay an ecologist that might have a quite a high um, hourly rate to, to get that information so that with that build up of data over time, it'll be easier for us to manage it and that it's not necessarily going to translate into more restrictive resource consent conditions. Um, so while on that's very positive um, and I'm quite excited that there's sort of that sort of joined up approach being taken for uh, this, this species, which is nationally endangered at a critical level. I do have a question actually about our urban design because what something that came out of the Amberfield um, um, sort of situation, I understand, is that the lighting is a real problem. And I'm just wondering whether or not, Julie, are we going to have to look at the, the lighting that we are sort of, um, I suppose, saying as a standard, you know, this is what, you, if you're putting in a subdivision and, you know, uh, you're going to have, have certain level of street lighting, like, are we going to have to have a much closer look at that? And then I don't know about headlights for cars as well. Is that, are you able to sort of comment on any of those points? Um, thank you, Councillor St. Pierre, and through you, Madam Chair. Um, potentially, it is something that could be included in urban design guides, um, especially for um, when we've got new structure plans and uh, design guides that go with them, that could definitely be included as a um, thing to be mindful of. At this stage, um, we don't have any rules or provisions um, imagined for the district plan at this stage. We want to look towards more what Chris was talking about, and that's um, education, raising awareness, and you know, maybe to start with getting developers on board um, just by having a chat to them about the way they design their subdivisions where lighting is um, an issue. I mean, I know that um, on the Kaikoura coast, I'm pretty sure that they've um, adopted some lighting rules um, down that way because the fledglings will fly into the light of wh whichever bird it is I can't remember sorry um, so it can be done and it doesn't necessarily have to be done by a rule if you get people on board and make them want to look after the bats <clears throat> great thank you Julie I think that does that pretty much cover up you cover off everything you wanted to raise with us today don't yes, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, um, for you to receive the report and to, because we're working together collaboratively with the other councils, we're all trying to move um, at the same time, move ahead. So um, I'd like to know whether you're happy for council staff in this council to keep working with the other councils and DOC and Mana Whenua to uh, investigate the next steps. Thanks, Julie. Look, um, I got, Andrew's got a thumbs up there. Look, I, I am uh, subject to that small caveat raised by yeah. um, Councillor Weber, but um, it, that does not um, um, uh, dissuade me from um, full, full wholeheartedly supporting this. So, I mean, Andrew, can I accept that you're happy to move that? And I will second that. Um, all those in favour say aye. 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 Against? No. Carrie. You're, 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 you're want to be recorded for, against? Yes, please. Okay, dokie. Um, Graham's <laughs> recorded again. Sorry, somebody's ringing me. Um, fabulous. No, <laughs> we're all entitled to those days, Graham. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Thanks very much for that, Julie. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for your time. Thank you, Chris, for your um, assistance. So that moves us on to our next um, recommendation appearing on page 92, which is a, re a recommendation to exclude the public. Um, I'm happy to move that from the chair. Claire is seconding it. All those in favour say aye. Aye. 